Have you recently finished your D&D campaign and you're looking for a new game that you can try out and play? Or do you like to hop around in different systems and games to try them out and see what they're capable of, but you don't really always know where to start from? Well, in today's episode of the RPG Goblin, we talk exactly about this and the steps of choosing the next game that you're going to play. Obviously, this isn't an end-all be-all, here's all the rules and the way to do it, but here's some things to basically keep in mind as I bring on Zachariah to talk all about this with me. We talk about considering genre, what your play style is, what mechanics are important, and all of those types of details on trying to choose what your next game should be, and whether or not you should stick with a system you're already comfortable with as well. So if that all sounds like a great time, then I think you will love this episode, and hopefully this will help you pick your next game for your next campaign or one shot. And if it does, let me know. I'd love to know. (laughs) But I think that's enough of me talking, so let's get into it. Welcome, everyone, to the RPG Goblin. I am your host and the resident goblin, Willow, and I am the one who asks all the questions. And in today's episode, we are going to be talking about choosing your next game, which I'm really excited about. And we'll we'll get more into what this means. But first, let's introduce our guest, Zachariah. Uh, Would you like to give yourself a little introduction and tell everyone what you do? Yeah, hi, I'm Zachariah. I make content for D&D on DMs Guild. I release it on the uh, through the Copper Dice Discord, but it's also all available on DMs Guild. Uh, just go ahead and search my name, Zachariah, and it'll all come up. I release everything there for free. It's mostly a way for me to take all of the side content that I generate in between like games that i play that i don't have an opportunity or maybe doesn't fit directly into my game right now as well as you know some of my ideas that i'm more proud of and i put all that up on dm's guild so yes amazing which i i have only i haven't looked at all of the stuff that you have up but what i have looked at is absolutely fantastic and i hope to also add it into some of my own personal games i mean we've already talked about some uh alternate rules and stuff that you've added into or th- that you've done for D&D that I've already added into my games and it's been amazing. So 10 out of 10 would recommend checking out Zachariah's content. It's fantastic. <laughs> uh, gold star to you. But yeah, uh, I'm very, very excited to have you on again. I absolutely loved when we talked about Morkborg or I guess Morkborg. <laughs> um, but I'm very excited to have you on again, especially because we're going to be talking about choosing your next game. Now, you know, what exactly, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit before recording, but what does that mean in this context? You know, choosing your next game, like what story I'm going to tell? Like, what what are we going to be talking about today? I think uh, what what we're going to be focusing more on, uh, although we'll see as the conversation drifts, because that's just <laughs> kind of what happens whenever we talk about anything. Um <laughs> Moreover, like choosing what system to play your next game in, or if yeah. you're wanting to play in another system, like what kind of a game would you want to play in that system? Mm-hmm. Um, because I think that if you're looking at like, oh, I really want to play Call of Cthulhu. Like if you really want to play Call of Cthulhu, what does that mean in the sense of like you want to play with the mechanics of Call of Cthulhu? You want to roll percentiles? Or do you mean that you want to, you know, like play in a 1920s Lovecraftian investigation type of game? Like, you know? Um, yes, yeah, so I guess the important aspects of like why you're choosing these games. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, in the case of something like, and I, and I guess just to jump straight into it, like if we if we talked about like Call of Cthulhu as an example, and maybe we'll have some other examples along the way, but it's on my shelf, so <laughs> it's the <laughs> one that I'm talking about. So I, as somebody who runs the game, I think a lot about the technical aspects of the game, and mm-hmm. I do love myself a D20 system. <laughs> um, and I do love the way that the, the math shakes out on with bounded accuracy. Uh, But there is something very, um, I want to say, like, (laughs) charming isn't really the right word that I'm looking for. Uh, But there's something, like, uh, compelling about, oh, this system is from the ground up just totally different and shiny and new to me. Because 
it doesn't use that die that I'm used to using for everything. It's all based on this other die that I look at all the time, but never roll. <laughs> Justice to the D10. Uh, or, well, I guess percentiles in general. Uh, they don't get used very often. But, yeah, no, I think that's that's amazing. And the want to, like, play with a new system just for the mechanical reasons, just to see what it has in store for you is so valid and i feel that very much <laughs> well and i and i uh in looking at it right it's like okay so call of cthulhu uses this like percentile based system um but it's not alone in that if you mm -hmm. look at um warhammer fantasy also uses percentiles mm -hmm. um and I think you can see right there that like you have a broad breadth of genre just between those mm -hmm. two, right? Like you have a more like dark classical fantasy, but more like a dark fantasy game that uses percentiles with uh, Warhammer Fantasy uh, RPG. But then you also have like this, you know, Call of Cthulhu uh, game. Um, which can has a breadth of like different um, settings because I know that there's like a Wild West Cthulhu setting. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I I know that there's also I was pretty sure I may be misremembering this, but um, that there is like a Dark Ages Cthulhu setting out there somewhere. If that's it's not official, it, I, if it's not official, it's out there on the internet somewhere. Yeah, right? for sure, like, someone's made it. <laughs> yeah, there's a ton of different genres for Call of Cthulhu. But I think one of the things that you have to decide when you're like, I want to, if you want to play Call of Cthulhu or not, is look into sort of the, look at the starter box and look at the mm -hmm. kind of adventure that they include in the starter box. Yes. I think that's a good place to start because that is going to tell you the game designer's thoughts as far as the type of game that this is going to be good for. Mm -hmm. They... They might be wrong, right? Like game <laughs> designers are people too. But at least for me, I think that's a good jumping off point of like, if this is a game that is meant for like epic fantasy, they'll probably tell you in the introduction that this is an epic fantasy. If they want it to be like an investigation, which is a lot more of what Call of Cthulhu is geared mm -hmm. towards. It's not really a combat based game. Mm -hmm. um, you don't if, have a lot of hit points. If you punch things, you're probably going to die. Uh, that's yeah. how I always heard it. <laughs> yeah, the intention isn't really for you to be getting into a bunch of extended combat. It's not that kind of game. Call of Cthulhu is also a uh, like a skills-based RPG, which is mm -hmm. also very different than something that's like a class-based RPG, like Dungeons yeah. & Dragons. Uh, it's because based as... like more of what your person can do, right? Well, also, like, as you use abilities, they continue to get better if you succeed, yeah. and they get worse Actually, if you fail. I is it is it through success on that one? Because I know there's one that goes through uh, succeeding on failure and one that goes through succeeding on success. I, I might be getting my Cthulhu that might be I, success. <laughs> I think I think it is. Uh, again, my wires might be crossed on this. I'm not an expert on Call of Cthulhu in particular, but. <laughs> Um, but I do know that I'm pretty sure that it does actually you gain because it's like it's a so your stats are all like between like one and a hundred. <laughs> I mean, I guess that they wouldn't really be one, but but you know <laughs> what I mean? Like they're they're more on the scale of hundred, yeah. like a hundred base scale rather than on a scale of like one to twenty. So you're allowed more incremental increases and decreases in your skill on things mm -hmm. because like if you have 65 in a skill or you have 66 in a skill like that is such a small difference but it allows you to like oh if i succeed on this then i get another plus one to this percentile which makes me incrementally better and it's a lot more like tweaking as you're going along yeah. rather than having like a set of stats that are by level rather fixed because if I'm correct from what I remember of Call of Cthulhu, you do have stats, but mm -hmm. like they do affect what numbers you have in your actual skills, but they aren't like the end all be all. Like they're not the only thing that determines that number because you, like you were saying, that success when you succeed on things, you get better at it over time and slowly. And so there are outside forces other than the stats that do connect to making those skills better, which I think is really, really cool. 
Yeah, and there's a lot more um, like mental focused stats in Call of Cthulhu because again, it's not really a combat game, and you can see that with other games that aren't really combat focused. Like uh, Vampire: The Masquerade is another good example. It's a game that <laughs> isn't really focused on combat in particular. Lots of social skills. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that game it tells you in the stats that it has sort of, and I guess that is also like a good way of I guess sussing out what kind of game you want to play is like look at the stats just look at a character sheet in that game and it'll tell you so much about the kind of game that it is indeed Um, i absolutely agree about agree on that especially if because i think a big a, a big thing that's good to keep in mind when you are trying to pick out a game is what where is the focus you know is it combat heavy is it maybe more storytelling focus and figuring out where you even land on that scale too like do you want something that's in the middle do you want something that's going to be just combat do you want something that's going to be a lot more narrative storytelling and then like you said looking at those character sheets and being able to kind of compare with the idea of the story you have in your mind and what that game actually supports is a really really good idea yeah, and along those lines, like you can tell that not only from the stats, but also just the complexity of the character sheet, how mm-hmm. complex the rules of this system are. Is this a rules light system or is it a rules heavy system? Is it really a crunchy system? You can kind of tell that just by looking at the character sheet mm-hmm. and get a vague idea of like, how many rules am I about to learn in order to play <laughs> this game? And do I want to invest the time? in order to do that and also the time of all of my uh friends who have you know been summoned here to play this game how much time do they have to invest in this and and you know how much do i need to carry the game as the person running it Mm -hmm. there's a Uh, lot of thought that needs to go in that and i actually there's there's a point there that i i'd like to make that i feel like when it comes to choosing a game it does i think it's very important to play games that the whoever's going to be running the game wants to play because having a GM basically learn a new game just for like a one shot is, is tricky. And there's a lot of work that has to go into that, especially like as a game runner. And I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, if, if your GM doesn't want to run a game that the entire group wants to play, other people in the group can actually step up to also run that as well. It doesn't always have to be on a like forever GM or whoever's kind of the normal GM of the group too. Like yeah. other people are able to take on that responsibility if that's a game that you really, really want to play and that like speaks to you too. Like, man, I really love this game. Learn it and, and run it for your friends because I think that's fantastic. I always love it when my friends run other games that I don't want to run. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a really good point. And I think that... Um... <laughs> not I, I'll, I'll not to divert too much, but I would say that that's true. Even if it's like just the game that you're playing, even if it's not like the actual mm-hmm. like like rule set that you're playing, but like if you're running a game and you're like, I'm just not feeling this anymore. I really mm-hmm. don't enjoy running this game. Like that is something to just bring up with your players that like I am not enjoying running this game and explain why and maybe there's something that you guys can all agree to adjust or change Mm -hmm. about the game that would make it more enjoyable or maybe you just kill that game and that's a really hard thing to do when people are invested in things especially depending on how deeply they're invested but i had an entire i had a campaign that was running for well over a month i think it was like a month and a half or two months that i ended up just going to my players and saying hey you know I'm getting so stressed out trying to think of ways to make this game move forward, and I'm enjoying none of it. Mm-hmm. Can we just start over? Yeah, because and like that is we, rough. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but that being said, like that being said, everybody in that game, like the people who wanted to rebuild their characters or bring back a character who had died, or like just do a hard reset, were able to because we just kind of started from scratch with similar characters a similar story but it, it it was more in line with what i had in mind and hadn't gone so far off of the rails like the first one had yeah and it ended up being one of my favorite games with one of my honestly one of my favorite like character deaths at my table was a player oh, of mine that's amazing. He, was, <laughs> he was playing he was playing like a rat folk uh named rat damon and oh. 
Uh-huh. And Rat Rat Damon faced down a uh uh oh gosh, the name in a lithid, um a mind flare, uh uh-huh. and said at me, and the uh mind flare disintegrated him. Yeah. Um, and it, it has gone down as a legend at our table of just like, oh yeah, like, you know, at me. Anytime that that player says at me, everybody gets nervous because the there was that one time. That's so good. That's and that amazing. wouldn't have happened if we didn't kill the entire previous version of that game. <laughs> like, the the previous version of that game had just gone so off the rails that that would have never happened, and that game ended up ending on a really, like, cool and positive note, but we had to kill it. So, yeah. to, I guess, just emphasize what you were saying about, like, if the GM is not interested in running their game, like, it, it's not going to, it's not going to go well. It's never going to be that great because there's a lack of investment from the person who I think in theory has the most investment. Not that your players aren't invested in your game, but like just for the amount of time that it takes to set up and host a game. Like your GM really has to be. Learning how to play it too, like yourself, like having to, like all of, at least in, in my experience. So I've recently started, I, I, not recently, it's been a few months, but I've started a game of Monster of the Week. And, mm-hmm. you know, my role as the keeper of that game, I read through the entire book. I actually have the like supplement for it. And I made sure to read through everything and was trying to be as well versed in the rules as possible. Well, my players only really read like the reference sheets of that game and their own character sheets. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say that like they care less about that game, but there is just a larger investment that a GM has to make when it comes to running games, whether it be having to read an entire rule book and be more well versed in the rules and all of those small things or even teaching the players how to play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I it's actually the reason why I have not run a game of Vampire the Masquerade is I I've been asked um, Mm -hmm. to like, hey, can you run a game of VTM? And I'm like, no, because I don't know enough about the masquerade. I don't know enough about the world of darkness to feel comfortable being the storyteller for that game because I just don't have I just I just lack so much knowledge in it. And I I like frankly feel like my investment in it would be disingenuous in the in the element of like oh I could just watch a ton of videos of like explainers yeah. of Vampire the Masquerade and read the read the books cuz they are on my bookshelf and mm-hmm. just read all of the stuff about Vampire the Masquerade and but like I haven't had a moment where I felt particularly grabbed by it that being said mm-hmm. There is someone who has reached out and said that they want to run a game and they want me to be a player. And now as a player, I am interested in Vampire the yeah. Masquerade. <laughs> I think it would be, well, because that is a level of investment that I'm like comfortable with. And also yeah. I don't feel like, I don't feel like I'd be ruining anything or ruining the, not ruining, but spoiling the experience for anybody mm-hmm. else at the table by being ignorant of the lore of Vampire the Masquerade because yeah, if I'm playing a so important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cuz like I wouldn't want to get anything factually wrong about mm. the uh, about the 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 world of darkness or about the way that things work based upon my on the on the in the moment decision making, right? Where it's like somebody's asking me a question about something lore related, and I wouldn't want to like pause the entire game, go on a Wikipedia rabbit hole and find the answer. I would probably just write down what my response is as like, okay, this is canon now. And I would worry that in a game with so much investment in its lore, that that sort of on the on the floor decision making uh, would spoil the experience rather than enhance it yeah absolutely i i would completely agree with that and i think that's a good point in knowing what's important in these games so vampire the masquerade is a great example of the lore is really important the lore of the world that has been built up over all of these years is very important to the game and while you still could play with using different lore it wouldn't work as well i shouldn't say it wouldn't work as well that's not the intended experience that a lot of people expect 
Yeah, I think that that would be for anybody who is, I think for anybody who is invested in the lore of the world, it would not be what they were expecting. And you would be mm-hmm. breaching the social contract a bit of like following people's expectations for a game because yeah. you can't invite somebody to a game of like, oh, we're going to play a game of D&D. And it's like, but guess what guys it's set in the wild west and Mm -hmm. actually there are no fantasy races we're all playing as human gunslingers and you know that is the premise of this game it is the 5e rule set but you know nothing that you would be expecting when you're invited to a game of dungeons and dragons unless somebody told you hey we're gonna do something wildly different with the genre we're gonna do something very different with the the lore um exactly and that that's and that, expectations and, is so important <laughs> yeah no absolutely and that's i think one of the one of the things that that does vary based upon the game system that you're playing right like if i'm playing the game uh, i have the conan rpg which is a 2d20 system which i really would love to play uh, because it's about 2d20 systems they seem interesting 2d20 says i like rolling 2d20s it's a <laughs> lot of fun and the way that the system the system uh if i'm remembering right because it's been a minute since i've read it but uh it's almost like inverted like rolling low is your objective and rolling high is oh, yeah. not good yeah, yeah. yeah, it's like it's like upside down in my brain. And I'm like, what a fun and creative way to use the same polyhedrals that we use all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really want to play it. But I but like that game, it's a Conan game, right? Like if you're playing the Conan RPG, people are going to expect it to be in that universe, right? Like that's baked in. It's on the tin. It's part of why we're here is you invited me to play Conan. Why are we not in the uh, Hyborian age playing mm-hmm. barbarians? Like what, what are we doing here if we're playing in some other like made up universe? Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess, I mean, they're all made up universes, but you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like you're playing some yeah. other universe. Why are we playing the Conan RPG? Uh, so there is definitely something to say about like expectations. When you invite someone to Call of Cthulhu, you may be able to get away with like. I mean, there are definitely so many versions of Call of Cthulhu, but when you invite people to the expectation that they are going to be dealing with this sort of existential Lovecraftian creepiness is, I think, the piece of it that is more uh, requisite than any particular set of lore right because lovecraftian is such a breadth of genre that you could set your call of cthulhu game in the 1920s in the 1950s in the 1870s like you have more leeway for like genre because lovecraftian mythos has like such a wide breadth of 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 available expectations yeah, for sure. I absolutely agree. And that's for, again, looking at what's important in the game is really important because, you know, looking at Conan RPG, like the setting is very important. Looking at Vampire the Masquerade, the lore is very important. Then there's other games like Call of Cthulhu, and I would even say things like Monster of the Week, where it's mostly an idea. Like this is the type of story we want to play when it comes to the setting and what you actually encounter is what varies like that isn't as important there's no lore that you have to follow because you know when i sign up to play monster of the week i expect to hunt a monster like that's really my own my only like social con like my my only like expectation going in like i expect to hunt a monster and if i don't then that's not i'm not playing that game yeah exactly like any particular lore (laughs) exactly like if you're playing monster of the week and there's no monster like then you would have that would call into question why you chose monster of the week to play Mm -hmm. out your like i don't know social etiquette scenario (laughs) right where it's like oh well you know uh the you know the the this man has been flirting with the Duchess and you have the letter and you might be able to like spoil the, like if you're having like a Regency era conflict from like a, a a Jane Austen novel, like maybe monster of the week, isn't the right game for you to play unless suddenly a monster jumps out, in which case Mm -hmm. by all means set it in the Regency era. It's going to be so fun to do that. I kind of want to do that now. 
<laughs> exactly. Like, there are so many different ideas that you can, like, fit into the monster, like, fit into a monster hunting, uh, like, story. That's what I love about uh, Doctor Who I've been watching a lot of recently. That's a Monster of the Week show through and through, and they do so much random stuff because it can go anywhere in time, anywhere in space. So it doesn't matter. All that matters is there's always a monster. Like mm-hmm. that is the and there's base of the and story. there's a and there's a doctor. Yeah, and uh, there's a doctor. Like, I mean, that's about the. Uh, it's, it's on the label. If he was, if the doctor wasn't there, <laughs> then something is very off about your episode, and we'll probably need to address that at some point. I'm sure that in the <laughs> history of Doctor Who, there has been an episode where the doctor didn't make an appearance. I, I I'm sure that there's You're somebody happy. who would listen to this and be like. Ah, I know exactly the episode where the doctor wasn't <laughs> present the entire time. And I'm like, yes, yes, but that is like a direct, like, you know, uh, it, it's running counter to our expectations deliberately. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, exactly. It, but, but the expectation is that you're going to get a doctor and you're going to have like some new wacky adventure that you're stumbling into through your, your time and space machine. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. But like, that's, that's what I, think is really important that's what i try and talk about a lot is like there are games that are meant for specific types of stories and it's not it doesn't necessarily like narrow what types of stories you can tell it's just yeah monster of the week is meant for monster hunting stories blades in the dark is meant for freaking uh uh oh god why can't i remember what they're called in the book the player characters uh, uh-huh. I call him scum, but I know that's Merkborg. Uh, <laughs> is it the oh, same okay. thing? Oh, uh, what are they? Whatever the the characters are in Blades in the Dark, like you're supposed to be basically like the bottom of the barrel criminals in like a horrible, terrible city, working your way up, and like you're supposed to be committing crimes and heists and stuff like that. And that's like the basis mm-hmm. of the story. You can have different settings for that. You can make the city whatever you want. You can make the people whatever they you want. But like the base of the game is to commit crimes and heists and and those types of stories. That's what yeah. it's built for. And it's amazing. And it's not that you can't play those types of stories in other games. There's just games that do those stories really well because those are what they're built for. Yeah, I think that there's there's two other things in this along this vein that I I do kind of want to address as far as mm-hmm. like picking a new system because you brought up uh, Blades of the Dark. Zeba Shu had a video about like running heists in D and D five e, and I think he even mentioned in the video about like you know people asking like why don't you just like learn how to play Blades of the Dark? Why don't you just like play a different system if you really wanted to do this why are you using all of these like different rules in order to play what you could play more like like i guess more um in genre in blades of the dark Mm -hmm. since that's what you're doing why jerry rig blades of the dark into 5e Mm -hmm. and i think the like the response and i've borrowed this to myself whenever i'm like recreating the wheel uh, right it's like there's some <laughs> other game that would be better suited for this and i'm adding those features into 5e like i've added sanity mechanics into 5e and it's like well you mm-hmm. could play call of cthulhu and it's like well there's a few reasons why i don't yep. and maybe this applies to somebody who's eyeballing other games and wondering whether they should like try playing those or if they should just steal features and import them into their own game Yep. Is wrong doing is that. do your do your players want to learn a new system right now? Are they invested with the world that they're currently playing in, and are you going to be engaging with those rules for a long enough period of time to make it worth learning an entirely new system to do it? Mm-hmm. Are you running a heist? In which case, if you're running a heist, it's probably not worth it to learn Blades in the Dark. And play a game of that and then never run another heist again (laughs) right like you have to consider is that the thing that you and your players are interested in doing time and time again Mm -hmm. 
or is it going to be like a one shot in which case maybe just borrowing some ideas is enough and just running the game in the game that in the system that you already know maybe that's enough Um, yeah i completely agree i think there's nothing wrong with modifying a game you're already playing like i think it's great to I think it's great to play games that are built for specific stories, but if you're comfortable playing 5th edition or whatever system you want to play and you're comfortable playing that, you're comfortable running it, then just go with that game and modify it if you need to. Like, I am completely fine with that. I I, I find it even fascinating to see what the modifications that people make to those games. It's amazing. Yeah, But I think yeah, that's it, a great point, is like, how it, long do you want to go like, how long do you want to use this game, and is that investment worth it? Yeah, and I do think that, well, I, I do believe that more people should be comfortable trying out new systems and be comfortable mm-hmm. trying out new games at their table. Um, I do also completely understand, like, this is my Saturday. I want to yeah. just go and play the game, and I don't want to have to learn a new system every single week or i don't want to learn a new system every month or even every six months like Mm -hmm. i only spend like as a player it's like i would only spend like you know the two to four hours a week to play the game and that's Mm -hmm. about my only interaction with it i don't want to learn a new game (laughs) right like i get it if you're busy this isn't like your number one i'm obsessed with it hobby like it Mm -hmm. is for birds like us (laughs) <laughs> uh, that is that is also fine and perfectly valid to just yep. be like, hey, you know, I'd rather just play the game that I already know. Uh, can yeah, you and just there's nothing wrong with being in your work? comfort zone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, that's fair as well. Um, <laughs> on a slightly different note, but it did come to mind and I made a note of it. Hi, uh, time for the middle segment of the episode to give a little bit of a break. If you need to get some water, go get some water. If you need a snack, make sure to go get a snack. Uh, This is the time to do it, I guess. But I hope that you are enjoying this episode of the RPG Goblin so far. And if you are, please make sure to leave a review wherever you listen to the RPG Goblin, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, anything. Please make sure to leave a review because it lets me know that people are enjoying it. It keeps this podcast going because I absolutely love doing this and I want to continue. And if you're really enjoying Zechariah and the ideas that he has, please, please, please make sure to go check him out on uh, DM's Guild, which again, all you have to do is type in his name, Zachariah, uh, which will be in the description of this episode and in the title. So <laughs> it'll make it easy for you. And you can find all of the awesome D&D 5e content that he has made and is really, really great to add into your own personal games because they're really fun mechanics. Now, Uh, Before we roll the promo, which is going to be for Game Master Monday podcast, which is a fantastic show that is almost kind of like a bit of a sister podcast in the way that they actually run a different game every single episode, or at least a one shot spread out through a couple episodes. And basically they play a bunch of different games so that you can get a taste of them and see how awesome they are. Just really awesome show. So make sure to stick around for the promo. But first... Uh, The next episode of the RPG Goblin is going to be coming out on September 15th, and it is going to be an episode about uh, The Guide to Death, which is a project anthology game that is going to be coming out on Kickstarter soon, and I bring on the project manager, uh, Mark Shepard, to talk all about this game with you, and I am so, so very excited because this entire anthology is all about exploring death through short TTRPG games and essays. And it's such a cool project. So make sure to keep your eyes and ears open for when that episode comes out again, September 15th. And yeah, I think that is enough for this part of the episode. Let's get into the promo. At last, I have reached the tallest peak in all the world, where the wisest person lives. Finally, I'll get the answers I seek. Welcome. I am the wisest person in the world. Ask me your question. What is my purpose in life? What should I be doing to achieve pure happiness? You must stream Game Master Monday. Come again. Game Master Monday, the bi-weekly podcast that plays a new one-shot in a new system in a new setting with a new cast every episode. 
Listening to their funny jokes and wild stories is the only path to happiness, my child. Sick. I'm going to go home and binge the whole thing right now. What a nice kid. Oh dear, he fell off the mountain. Now they'll never know how good Game Master Monday is. On a slightly different note, but it did come to mind and I made a note of it, is when you are going to play a new game and you're like, okay, I have in front of me the Warhammer 40k Wrath and Glory box set. I'm all gung-ho to play it. This is based on a true story of I have all of this. Uh, and I'm gung-ho to play it. How do you actually go about playing that for the first time at the table? What level of investment do you as a DM take in learning those rules and in getting your players up to speed with those rules in order to play a one shot or something in a system that you've never played before? I have my like my system for doing it. I'd actually but, love to hear it. <laughs> uh, um, so I think a good example of this is uh, I, so we did this. It wasn't in a tabletop RPG, but it is the most recent new game that I played. And it was Munchkin. Have you ever played Munchkin? Oh, have fun. Yeah, Munchkin's great. OK, I I never played Munchkin before. And we're I, I have a group of friends like two people at the table have played it before, but it was years ago and they don't really remember. And then there's two people, myself and another friend who also who, who have who have never played like we've never played it. And we have like the uh, what is it? It's the critical role like Munchkin box set. Yeah. And so we're like, OK, we're going to be playing with these cards. One, it's like a variation of a game that two of us have never played. And so the other two had never played this version of it. So it's all brand new <laughs> now. Exciting. It's like even your. It's like even your valid knowledge and, and remembrances from years ago are no longer valid because these have mm -hmm. different cards of different rules. Uh, and the way that we would go about learning it is we all agreed at the start of it. I was like, we're going to just start playing. Like we, I've read through the rules, but reading through the rules doesn't mean anything when you sit down at the table. Mm -hmm. Right? Because immediately half of the stuff you read falls out of your head. Yep. <laughs> and it's like, okay, we're going to start playing. And if we run across a situation that we don't know what the rules are, we're going to make a call on the spot, decide mm -hmm. what the rule is, and keep playing. And yep. then if we stumble upon that rule at some point in the future and we find out how wrong we were, then we'll change it and we'll do that going forward. But we're not going to stop the game for anybody, for everybody to look up the exact rules. Mm -hmm. Because that's going to happen so often that you're never going to get to actually playing. And I would say, I would say I do the same thing for RPGs. Like if I'm sitting down to play Merkborg, if there is a Merkborg's a bad example, it's so rules light, you can make up the rules on the spot that's fine <laughs> but let's say i'm playing pathfinder mm -hmm. right like and it's going to be my first time playing pathfinder i am not i i fundamentally disagree with the idea of we're playing a game we all gathered here on our day off to spend four hours to play this game and i'm going to spend an hour of it looking up rules mm -hmm. I really do not like the idea of that as a player or as a DM. I don't, as much as I like looking up rules and learning rules in my spare time, when I'm sitting there at the table, I don't want to learn. I don't want to spend my time researching. That yeah, isn't my idea of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm like, once we get to the table, you turn to your DM and you say, make a call. How do we rule this scenario? And the DM will use their best understanding of the rules to make a fair decision. And that's what you're going to do until later when we end up looking this rule up later and we find out that we were totally wrong. Yeah, right? and it works even if you're going to play a game like for a one shot. Like that's the best way to do it. Like just make a call because you probably won't play this game more if you're just going to be playing it this one time. Like, there's no reason yeah. to do all this research into the rules 
just to be like, okay, that was fun and never touch it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially, yeah, like, especially on a on a system that is a lot more heavy. If you don't have, mm-hmm. this is, of, of course, this is advice more for geared towards, like, you're playing a game that you came across and you don't know anybody who knows the rules. Yeah. Right? It's like, how do you learn the rules to a game that you've never played before? It's like, well, literally, you just, you make a call in the moment whenever you stumble across something that you don't know how to handle and then you just carry on that is precedent and you use that rule for the rest of the evening and if it yeah, seems and like that is else understands <laughs> yeah and as long as it's the same rules for everybody and that rule isn't like changing willy-nilly like or without cause because you may discover that your call was wrong right mm-hmm. it's like hey like you know i made the call that you know it would be fair to do this in the given scenario and it turns out that if we allow that that the game becomes broken and completely unplayable super fast Uh right and then it's like okay maybe i made the wrong call on that maybe we'll try it a different way and then you'll probably look in the rules and find out that like that that is not the way that that calling is supposed to be made (laughs) hopefully yeah but Um, i mean like as long as you're in a good group like those mistakes on on you know calling a rule and stuff like that shouldn't be that big of a deal because like you know we're all just trying to play and have fun and as long as that was achieved as we were playing then you know no harm no foul <laughs> yeah exactly like there there are some like in the case of like warhammer 40k wrath and glory right like this is a tabletop rpg that is set in warhammer 40k's universe and that is the reason i want to play it mm-hmm. that is the entire reason is just i like the universe of Warhammer. I like the genre that it has like created and I want to play in that universe and I'm not particularly interested in investing in the actual war game. So mm. this seems right down my alley. The system is like a it is like a dice pool system with like d6s. It's a d6 system and yeah. It has like these, you know, it, and it seems very, very cool. And I have the box set for it, but I do know that the box set does not have all the rules in it, obviously, right? Like it's the condensed version of it. So there will be scenarios that we come across that are going to be outside of the scope of the beginner box rule book. And mm-hmm. when that happens, I'm going to have to just make a call for somebody to roll a die. And if they roll the number high, they get to do the thing, right? <laughs> like that, that fundamentally, I think as far as like role play, well, as far as like tabletop games that have a DM, game master, you know, storyteller or whatever, like whoever the person is that is your master of ceremonies and your referee, like that person uh, making the call of hey flip a coin if heads you get the thing mm-hmm. is like fundamentally like historically important for the purposes of running this sort of like game at a table it's the entire yeah. function right like the entire function of the dm historically is as a referee for war games to decide when two players can't decide who wins a given <laughs> bout. It's like, well, there's somebody sitting on the sideline, an impartial party who makes the call. Um, yeah. And that's actually an interesting way to look at it as well, which um, I do want to talk a bit about, since you mentioned that you really want to play uh, Warhammer for the setting itself, like that's a big draw of why you want to play that game. That is also a important element when looking at TTRPGs is the setting and the themes that you are going to be playing in that game with. Like, you know, looking at Vampire the Masquerade, people who are in love with that setting would want to play that game because they love that lore and they love everything that comes with it. Same thing with Warhammer. Uh, There's some other games that uh, Alien RPG even could be the same thing with, you know, and love those movies and you want to explore that world. Yeah, Conan, and also there's a, a Dune RPG. Um, there's yeah, there's there's a whole bunch of them where it's like yeah, you're you're going not for not just for the mechanics of the game, you're absolutely going for the genre, and hopefully, the creators of this game have matched the mechanics to the genre of the game, and that's at least always the hope. Yeah. <laughs> um, there, I'm sure that there are games out there where that is not the case. 
right? Where the the creators of the game might have made a miscalculation of the kind of game that they were running, and maybe the mechanics don't match the genre particularly well. Um, but I haven't encountered that yet. So, so far, my experience has been that there are some games that I like the mechanics of, others that I don't. Mm-hmm. But I haven't found one yet that felt particularly mis- mis- mismatched. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Because... Yeah, I haven't either. Really, when I've I've looked through and read, I mean, I've played, I've played quite a few games. A lot of them shorter one shots, but mm-hmm. I I haven't encountered any issues where it's like, oh man, that's a weird rule to put in this uh, magical girl game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and like the mechanics of like wrath and glory. What I think is really interesting about like the Warhammer game particularly sorry the warhammer 40k wrath and glory the reason why i keep Mm -hmm. specifying this because there is a separate very different warhammer fantasy rpg warhammer Mm -hmm. fantasy rpg has been around since the 80s at least and warhammer 40k wrath and glory has been around since i think 2014 or 2016 like it's relatively Mm -hmm. new and Warhammer versus Warhammer is also just kind of confusing to explain to anybody who hasn't like physically seen the difference because it's like, oh, mm-hmm. there's like this whole fantasy genre uh, that is Warhammer and there's this whole science fiction genre that is Warhammer and the worlds aren't really connected. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you can put together a canon where they somehow connect, but I don't care to because I think keeping them <laughs> separate is better. Um, Because they're both accomplishing very different kinds of, like, settings, worlds, and stuff. Yeah. Um, But if you look at the actual mechanics of Wrath and Glory, the game is not... um, It's, it's, weirdly enough, not a super tactical game. Mm -hmm. Which I thought was interesting, because the war game itself is a war game, and is all about (laughs) tactics and fighting and combat. Um, But the actual like RPG that they built is mechanically a lot more similar to Vampire the Masquerade. It's actually, it's actually, despite it's a D6 system instead of a D10 system, but it is largely based upon like a pool of dice and a bunch of successes or failures adding up to whether you succeed or fail. While the subject matter is, oh, do you succeed or fail at like, you know, punching through the hull of a ship or or breaking a, in a, you know a space orc's jaw or whatever. Like the <laughs> the actual like mechanics of it are a lot more narrative focused, and you can see that in like systems like Vampire the Masquerade, how the the mechanics of it serve narrative. And I thought that that mm-hmm. was very interesting. That the Warhammer game to make itself super contrast from the war game that it originated from has mechanics that are a lot more like focused on emphasizing narrative rather than combat mechanics like tactile positioning that is mechanics fascinating yeah it's 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 so really one of the reasons why i'm i'm so interested in it is because it's mm-hmm. it's a lot more of a narratively focused set of mechanics when you when you look at it um, yeah oh that's amazing which again that's another good thing to keep in mind is like you know is is this combat do I want to focus on combat or do I want to focus on more storytelling that's social and stuff like that and looking at those mechanics too? Like you, you, and even knowing what you want to play around with, let's say you've only played really heavy tactical, like TTRPGs that are like very combat focused. You might want to try something light and more narrative just to see how that feels too. Yeah. And I think um, in the case of like, the the more rules the more crunchy systems i think tend to be the ones that are less um storytelling focused they're a lot more mm-hmm. technical um and i think that that is suitable for an audience that is more uh technically technically uh inclined i guess as far as the games that they play um that isn't personally for me i do like games that are narrative i of course i love combat in D, and i like i like the i like the 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 role that it serves in Mm -hmm. playing the game as far as creating drama and tension and 
creating a deeper investment because there is there are stakes yeah. um but i think of it as more of a as a conveyor belt for stakes than as a like oh it was so satisfying when you moved from this position on the map to that position of the map <laughs> in order to you know in order to put yourself in a position to succeed here like when my players talk about combat, at least the group that I have together, right? Like, mm -hmm. we never talk particularly about the tactical elements of combat after the combat is done, mm -hmm. right? Like, nobody reminisces about their positioning or about their, um, or about their, like, choice to use like people will talk about spells like spells yeah. making an impact or they'll talk the about cool things that they did <laughs> yeah they'll talk about critically hitting this thing whatever but they won't talk about like the technical elements of the decision making for the combat long after it's done they will talk about the narrative impact of who died who lived who mm -hmm. saved whom if anybody did something where they made a choice to save one person rather than leave. Like they'll talk about the narrative impact of mm -hmm. what the combat's fallout is yeah. a lot more. And so, which I, I know is very like, for me, I like chess. I like playing chess, right? And chess is entirely <laughs> a tactical game. And like the joy does come from like, oh yes, I moved here. I did this. And this is why I won. Right. Like, but I feel like in tabletop games, the group that I'm playing with on the, a regular basis has never been particularly interested in that kind of tactical satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So for me, I will be drawn more towards games that have mechanics to, you know, push the narrative forward or will um, where combat is fast um, yet impactful, where mm -hmm. they're where I do want them to have obviously choices and decisions that they make that are based off of those like combat scenarios, but I don't want them to be like pushed out of their narrative choices because they had to make a smart tactical decision. Yeah, if that makes no, sense. I like, agree. <laughs> like it's, it's almost like a, it almost bridges a gap into, and we'll probably talk to, about this at some point in more in depth, but it almost is like the gap between people who like power game to play the game for the sake of being good at the game versus mm -hmm. people who just want to play the game in order to tell a particular type of story or bring yeah. it's out a like particular that middle kind ground. of character. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that there's, there's definitely like leanings into that territory mm -hmm. that I I'm getting with this is like, if, if the game, doesn't have a combat system i don't mind as long as if there is combat that combat has a meaningful outcome right and like, i think that's more... partially on whoever's running it as well as you know whoever's running the game also makes a lot of the tone differences too you know because there are people who like to run D D in the way of having the combats be uh few and far between but very heavy in narrative and there's people who like to play in a way that they present combats often for people to just demolish <laughs> mm -hmm. enemies. And so, you know, even if the game is set towards a specific view and how to play the game, that doesn't mean it will always match up because it will always semi depend on, well, not semi, it will depend on who's running the game too. Yeah. Well, I also think that there is, is another thing to be said for like, the amount of combat that you want in your game is you can kind of suss out based on like if you're looking at like how much combat is there and how long will it take um you can look at the number of hit points that things have mm -hmm. and interestingly for me like even a game like Merkborg, right where it's like oh you have like such a low hit point pool you have two hit points and you might die at any time mm -hmm. um I feel like for me, the game drifts often more into like narrative mm -hmm. than combat because combat is such a risky thing that your players will avoid it whenever possible. 
um, unless it is something that they feel like they absolutely have to partake in. They have to mm-hmm. deal with it. They can't just like, you know, normally they would just be like, oh, I run away. And then you roll a check and see if they got away or they would be like, no, I'm not going to travel to the doom cave of death <laughs> and and do that unless there is but a strong so enough fun. reason. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. But it's like, unless they feel like they have a reason to go there. And so I, I felt like for me, proportionally, the amount of time spent in combat in a game like Merkborg is so much lower than in a game that, that than in a rules is written standard game of D&D 5e, mm-hmm. right? Or then in a game of, of, well, literally any game with low hit points. You can kind of yeah. say the same thing. Like, lower hit points, I think, naturally means that your combats will... Well, not even naturally. Your combats will be shorter. The hit yep. points are smaller. There will yep. be fewer turns. So That's combat... what it is in Monster of the Week, too. Because exactly. I think the hunters have, like, seven hit points. And, and average... Well, the hunters have seven, and then the monsters can have up to, like, maybe 12. But that's, like, really yeah. high level high level when people have weapons that could do like four or five hit points in a hit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And so I think that there is is absolutely like something to say about the the correlation between like, oh, are the hit points lower? You'll end up with ironically less combat and more narrative in yeah. a combat focused game that has lower hit points. Right. And also because... even looking at the abilities that the characters get as well and how focused they are on combat versus how focused they are on maybe social skills or or mental skills and stuff like that. Yeah. 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 And and, and uh I mean and that brings us full circle back to like Call of Cthulhu. It is an investigation based <laughs> game. It is a game that has a lot of stats that are related to investigations. There mm-hmm. are a lot more mental stats than in something like 5D, but that's because that is the focus of the game is about making checks in order to investigate things and get a better understanding of the mystery that is to be solved, because there's mm-hmm. always a mystery to be solved. And it will um, usually probably end deadly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And 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 I I mean that is that is sort of the 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 horror is almost like self-imposed in some Lovecraftian stories where it's like it it gets worse because you're looking into it. Yeah. Um, where if you just if you just were blissfully unaware, then you wouldn't be able to 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 comprehend what it is that you're you know seeing, and so you just yeah. wouldn't. Um, <laughs> There's, there's actually a this is a, a bit of a bridge of genre, but um, it is Lovecraftian though. But like in the, uh, did you ever hear about or like play the game uh, Bloodborne? Uh, yes, I've heard about it, and I've been wanting to play it so bad. <laughs> uh, hopefully someday maybe they'll bring in yeah. HD remaster out. But um, <laughs> I'm not going to hold my breath because people have been saying that for like years. <laughs> um, but uh, there is an element in that game where, like, you collect insight, and as your insight rises, like this score basically of insight rises, you're able to actually see more enemies. Oh, sure. uh, like you can see different things, and it's like, huh. well, if you raise your insight, you oddly become more like the world around you becomes more bizarre and more strange mm-hmm. and more um, alien. Because you now have a better, you have more insight into the world around you, so you have context by which to see more Lovecraftian horrors and move further away from the grounded world. And I, I think that there's an element of that in Lovecraftian horror that is super dope. Yeah, um, no, for sure. <laughs> that you definitely could work into. I mean, naturally, that is sort of the like. Uh, there's like madness mechanics in Call of Cthulhu that are similar mm-hmm. to that. It's like. You know, uh, but there's also uh, ways to convert that into your current game. If you're not ready to take the plunge and play a brand new game, but you want those elements, there are conversions. I know that Sandy Peterson made a Cthulhu book, uh, or maybe it's a PDF that converts like Call of Cthulhu things. Because uh, if I'm not mistaken, Sandy Peterson helped create or did create Call of Cthulhu. I believe uh, so, because I recently saw that as well. 
Yeah, and he um, he made like a, I know that he made a Pathfinder conversion for the for like Call of Cthulhu things and Pathfinder. I think he did one for Five E as well, uh, but I think it's a lot harder to find. Um, but you can find those sorts of things too if you're not ready to like start the plunge into a brand new RPG. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, but, yeah. I, I I completely agree. And you can even do those things in a more narrative way too if you don't want the mechanics. Uh, yeah, you could absolutely add Lovecraftian horror into any game that you do just your approach whether you want to do it through narrative and storytelling or mechanics is up to you yeah and how important it is that your mechanics uh like reflect the narrative or not like depending Mm -hmm. upon what level of abstraction you're content with i i for one like things to sort of run parallel but not a not in depth right like i don't want to i don't want to have people make a i actually was talking to a friend about this i was like we should make a game that is like way too detailed to the point that like combat well because my thought was like you could have like every articulation of your arm and like joints be a separate action so to do one (laughs) round of combat you could do like 28 actions you have to use an arm action in order to bend your elbow action in order to point your sword action uh and then you could and then you you could use like 20 some turns just in order to do like a basic single thing from D&D, but it would be so in depth and like Mm -hmm. the entire game would be just one round of combat like that would be the entire four hour session is just one round of combat a slight shift in position and we end <laughs> and i really want to make this a thing but at the same time like it, it's purely just there as almost like a like a satire of the idea of being too like too in depth in your combat yeah. like we're yeah we're denying you any abstraction of combat and therefore you know your decisions are all meaningful but nothing ever happens Oh, oh my god, that would be absolutely insane. <laughs> like I, I really I if I had the uh inclination, I would want to create like a you know a hundred page PDF for this, but it's just such a dumb idea. I'll never actually make it, but somewhere somewhere out there, if someone has the dedication, I would love to see it. <laughs> yes, please someone do it. Um it'd be very insane and awesome to see. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, what it, and the entire game would just be one round of combat. The game. Yep. Yep. Uh, <laughs> one round of combat the game. Oh my um, lord. But like yeah, but yeah, so yeah. I think I uh to, to the entire point of, of of today's like topic, I I think that if you like the genre, if you like the you like the vibe of the game, mm-hmm. I would look at like, do you like the 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 literally like the do you like the box art in the title? <laughs> uh, look at the rules, get like a general idea of the basic game loop mm-hmm. that very fundamental of like in if I'm looking at uh Call of Cthulhu, it's roll percentiles, roll uh I believe it's a roll under your score, right? Like so if you have like a 65 score, you want to roll uh below that in order to succeed. Mm-hmm. Um and that is like the the basic gameplay loop. If it's you know DD 5e, it's roll a d20 roll high right like that is the yeah. fundamental gameplay loop that everything is based around so it's like yeah, you and find I that, that is very yeah so, so sorry uh so you like so you like find that first fundamental gameplay loop and that is the gist of the game you know gloss over the basic version of the rules and then just see if your players are down to give it a one shot see if they want to yeah. play it and sit down and be like we're gonna play this game we don't know the rules but we're going to learn them together. And if we come across anything we don't know what the rule is, we're just going to make it up and keep moving, and we'll just write it down and look it up later. And if we all have fun, maybe we'll play this some more. And if we absolutely, if everybody hates it by the time that we're done, we'll never play it again. <laughs> like... <laughs> Exactly. As long as you're clear. No, but I think that's a great thing. Playing a one shot in a system first, or even like a like a mini arc that might be like, I don't mm-hmm. know, to five sessions well i mean how many one shots are really one shots willow like how many of your one shots actually ran for one session and then stopped i'm sure there's some but there's got to be a plethora that turned into twos there there are a lot of dnd 5e one shots that i've been a part of that end up turning into 
a million shots. Um, <laughs> I've actually found when I switched to playing other TTRPGs that are more specifically geared towards one shots, mm-hmm. suddenly they started to actually fit in one session. Um, but <laughs> yeah, miraculously, I mean, to be fair, like I did once play Merkborg like while on vacation in a hotel room with some friends. So like. And it was just one session, but you're you're absolutely right. Like longer form uh, games seem to just force themselves to be longer. Yeah, once it starts getting into more crunchy and more rules and stuff like that, I feel like that's kind of how it happens. But what I what I was going to say is like when it comes to those games, a one shot or even like a mini arc, you can play just one of those. Just you know, as simple as it comes, we're going to go through a story. And then when you finish playing, you can always decide what you want to do. And I actually love this quote. I can't remember where I saw it, but a one shot is just a a one shot can be a successful pilot episode to a campaign, basically. So if you mm-hmm. like really love the game and you love the stories and you love the characters, when you play a one shot, just continue on. If if you had that much fun with it, you can always turn it into a much larger campaign, and that's just fantastic. I think. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that that is a, a good a good summation of it to give things <laughs> a try and to um, to see how they go, because it yeah. is if you find a game that you really, really like and that you very much enjoy, then maybe that can be the game that you guys are playing as a group for years and years to come. Because mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of them. There's so many. There are. And there's all there. I don't think that I will ever play through all of the games I would love to play through in my life because (laughs) there are just so many and they also take time to play themselves too. You know, Mm -hmm. it can take several weeks to even years if you're going through like long form campaigns. Uh, But yeah, it is absolutely fascinating. And, you know, it's always going to be when you finish your game, it's like, what are we going to play next? And I do hope that you consider a new game, just even to see what is out there. And like Zachariah said, if it's going to be the new game that you play for years and years and years, because if you at least give it a shot, you give it that opportunity to become that game. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for, uh, talking to me again and you know taking time out of your day i do appreciate it absolutely thank you for coming on again and talking about me with this because this has been amazing and talking about games is always extremely fun uh and i've i always enjoy talking with you so yeah thank you so much for coming on and thank you everyone who listened and yeah i think that is the end of the episode please make sure to go check out zachariah's content on dm skilled uh, again, all you do have to do is look up his name, Zachariah. <laughs> and I think that is the end. So thank you everyone so much. And thank you, Zachariah, for joining me. Thank you. Do, do, do.